Hello, I'd like to talk about restoring multi-life stage connected aquatic habitat for Atlantic salmon uh, via geomorphic forcing and gravel bed river restoration. I'd like to acknowledge and support my colleagues uh, Hamish Moyer and Rebecca Glenn. We're all from Seabeck Eco Engineering in Inverness in Scotland and the UK. I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the various estates, uh, regulators and funders whose logos are at the bottom below. I'd like to start by giving you examples of two unrestored Scottish Highland reaches. Uh, the first one being this one, the Upper River Nairn, imaged here in 2017. Very highly straightened reach, as I've tried to emphasise in the, the graphics here, with a high sediment supply and embankments, which has resulted in this particular channel being significantly perched and disconnected from its floodplain. So it's much higher up than its, than its floodplain. Image here taken along the old channel, after we dewatered it in order to, to bring it down onto its floodplain as part of the restoration. And this shows very little geomorphic complexity and a habitat for Atlantic salmon, as you can, can imagine. Another image showing the bottom end of the site, showing how gravel has been extracted from this channel over the years, forming embankments either side, further disconnecting the channel. The second example I'd like to look at is the Alt Lorgi, not too far from the upper of Vernairn in the north of Scotland. This image from 2012, showing significant embankments uh, from extracted river gravels. Uh, the channel's disconnected from its floodplain, but this time slightly incised in places, so it's lower down than its floodplain. Um, but it's also constrained using large boulder armour at several points, preventing lateral migration. Now, the restoration tools that we've employed on the upper of our Nairn are mainly large wood and rootwood placements, plus realignment of the channel onto its floodplain and significantly wetland formation. Now, wood is a fantastic material in order to build uh, structures that force the channel hydraulically and therefore hydromorphically. Um, the wood itself, natural material, it provides habitat at a small local scale, uh, but also provides a, a fast moving shear layer around the, the, the structure, which forms a scour pool and a sinuous thalweg. And in the wake of the structure, we get bar formation and sediment storage. And within that sediment sorting, we typically tend to get uh, a, a gravels of a size that are, are suitable for salmon spawning. So all scientific talks, I think, should have pictures of diggers in them. Here's a picture of one of McGowan's diggers placing large wood structures on the upper Vernier restoration out onto the, the, the floodplain of the channel. Now, this uh, initial channel, relatively simple, just a trapezoidal channel, but we knew with that high sediment supply and these wood placements, we would very rapidly develop geomorphic complexity. The middle image here showing the, the, shows the height difference between the perched original channel on the right of the image and the um, a wetland floodplain areas that we were connecting it to. The last image shows uh, the obligatory uh, drone image of the channel with um, a, the river reeling down to its floodplain going through the, the various wetlands um, uh, with a diverse range of habitat. The restoration tools in the Altlorgi were similar. Uh, again, we used large wood and root wood placements, uh, but we also removed embankments and augmented the gravel in the channel by uh, the, the gravels that formed those embankments. We also removed the boulder alar armour, allowing the, the channel to, to move it out onto its floodplain. So we did a significant amount of morphodynamic sediment transport and hydraulic modelling for both of these reaches. Um, we were relatively pleased with the morphodynamic modelling. They showed a similar evolution as to that observed in the design channel. This uh, slide here shows the surveyed bed with model depth and, and, uh, and uh, velocities. Eight months post restoration. Um, the image below that shows the, the, the modelled bed evolution and depth post uh, multiple storms. And we see a similar development of pools next to the pieces of wood, riffles forming and bar formation, but also bit elements of braided channel formation too. And what we hoped is this growth of hydraulic and bed form complexity should result qualitatively in diverse aquatic habitat. We also did um, other analysis on the alt Lorgi as well as hydraulic modelling. We performed a geomorphic unit toolbox um, analysis. And this shows a very large increase in geomorphic complexity since the restoration uh, from 2012 to 2016. We see in the images here a significant growth in various different types of geomorphic um, bar forms and bed forms that are utilised by salmon for, for, for habitat, either as fry eh, or as adults for spawning. A significant part of the restoration for the River Nairn was the development of wetlands or taking the, the realigned channel through 
areas we knew would form wetlands that were, were typically damp and wet before uh, we did that realignment. We knew that these areas would act as a sink for, for fine sediments, um, but also develop little channels within them uh, and creating uh, a wide range of habitat for a wide range of different species. For instance, these wetland areas are, are, are colonised by waterfowl, uh, produce a large amount of invertebrates, and we hope that that biodiversity and, and variation in hydraulics would act as, as, as other areas of habitat for Atlantic salmon. We didn't design any specific wetlands in the alt Lorgi restoration, uh, but our morphodynamic modelling suggested that development of wetlands would be a natural consequence of, of the restoration and connection to the, the floodplain. We did some morphodynamic modelling, in fact, that showed that the, the, the downstream end of the site would likely suffer um, I don't know if suffers the right word, we would likely um, encounter um, an avulsion of the channel out onto its floodplain. In 2020, so just this year, maybe about six months after we did this morphodynamic modelling, the, the channel did indeed uh, follow this exact process. A slug of sediment moved down the channel, uh, blocked off this particular region downstream, and the channel evolved out onto the floodplain through some trees. This has produced quite a, a nice little area of habitat, with lots of tree cover for fish, a variation in sediments, fairly fast moving flow in certain areas, and little braided channels forming between the bits of wood. So good invertebrate habitat on deadwood, um, a, a, a wetland plants, and also a range of gravels for fish. So how do we go about quantitatively assessing aquatic habitat for Atlantic salmon? The first uh, habitat they would like to assess is that for salmon spawning. So here we have a few images showing, uh, basically stills from a video, showing a female salmon cutting a red. Now red is essentially a hole in the gravels uh, that the female cuts, uh, in which she lays her eggs, and the male salmon comes along, fertilises those eggs, and the female then covers them back over with gravel, with the eggs, uh, and eventually leavings, existing in the gaps between the bits of gravel. So biologically, what we need is that the gravel needs moved by the female and the eggs need oxygenated by the, the channel. So spawning requires appropriate hydraulic conditions and also appropriate substrate size. In order to assess this habitat, uh, some of Hamish Moyer's work uh, has, has, has found out that the best parameter to use hydraulically is that the fruit number, a non-dimensional variable which characterises longitudinal bed forms in a channel. And that's a ratio of the square of velocity and depth. Um, obviously, the other parameter which characterises spawning habitat is substrate size, and so we use both of those to determine habitat suitability for spawning. When we do this for the Upper River Nairn, we see that the existing channel, outlined in red here, has very little um, predicted spawning habitat, and that correlates with anecdotal uh, accounts of, of very little spawning in this, this particular reach, as we might have expected. Um, in the design channel, we see much more geomorphic complexity and so therefore much more spawning habitat. And that correlates with the number of reds that we've seen in the channel between 2017 and 2020. Uh, if you remember, the existing channel had very little in the way of hydraulic or geomorphic bed forms, um, uh, quite an armoured bed in places, and so almost no spawning habitat. Essentially, no habitat diversity, which is necessary for river productivity. Uh, an image here showing much more diverse gravels uh, and a red uh, photographed in the channel uh, a couple of years ago. So as I say, habitat should be diverse. There's no point having uh, spawning habitat if there's also not habitat for juveniles. Similarly, there's no point having juvenile habitat if there's no spawning habitat in the channel. Uh, juveniles also require appropriate hydraulic conditions and substrate size in order to hide in uh, and to, to survive floods. Um, and also as a, a food source, it's the hydraulics which supply food um, and these uh, young fry want to stay close to their spawning grounds. They're water column drift feeders and so they, they feed on either aquatic invertebrates or aerial invertebrates that fall into the channel. Uh, we assess uh, the habitat for Atlantic salmon fry using Marine Scotland's freshwater laboratory model which essentially takes data from a river uh, in Scotland called the River Vech where they seeded this particular channel with, with a large number of fry and then electrofished the channel to find out where those fry had gone, what habitat they had utilised. That essentially takes depth and velocity from our hydraulic models and predicts the, the, the fry habitat that exists in the channel. 
We also um, use a macro and vertebrate drift model, which takes again depth and velocity in the channel from our hydraulic models, but also turbulence parameters and the seeding density of invertebrates to work out essentially where invertebrates would end up if they, they, they dropped into the channel or released from the substrate. When we apply this, uh, both this invertebrate drift model and the Marine Scotland statistical model to our, our channels, we see that the, the old channel, uh, outlined in red here, did have significant fry habitat, but remember it had no spawning habitat. Um, the design channel also has significant fry habitat, that fry habitat uh, correlating with the, uh, the, the, the drift that we model in the channel, uh, unsurprisingly. But uh, there is no um, fry habitat predicted in the wetland areas. Uh, nevertheless, there's no uh, data in the River Vaich for wetlands. We, there's an absence of data about wetlands in Scotland, but we don't know if that actually means that there are no Atlantic salmon fry utilising wetlands. You would think they would have evolved um, to, to cope with wetland areas, but there are none really in our data sets predicting fry. There's very little drift in the wetland uh, from our, our drift model. And so we might say, yeah, well, there's no drift, so therefore there's no Atlantic salmon fry in these wetland areas. But they do produce approximately twice the density of invertebrates per square metre as channel areas. So we would expect that there's a large food source there that might end up somewhere else in the channel, uh, or those aerial invertebrates um, that come from those wetlands may seed the channel elsewhere. It is therefore uh, still an open question as to whether Atlantic salmon fry use these wetland areas. It's a bit strange because we know that in the Pacific Northwest, Chinook salmon uh, have been shown to grow much uh, larger if they're on floodplain and wetland areas than when they're confined to the channel. But it's still an open question or a, a bit controversial as to whether salmon, Atlantic salmon fry uh, will use wetland areas, possibly because Atlantic salmon par are very territorial and aggressive. Um, so there are different social uh, aspects to these fish from, from Pacific ones. Yeah, there's no um, a wetland designed, as I said, for the Alp but when we apply the, um, the Avulst um, channel going through a new wetland area uh, with our statistical fry model and drift model, we see that, 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 that on the contrary to the, the Nairn, this wetland is shown to have quite good fry habitat. The velocities are, are significantly faster than the larger wetland areas than the, the River Nairn. Uh, the channel also goes through some wood, some dead wood, so a good source of invertebrates and a, a wide range of different gravels uh, for fry to fry to utilise. Our only issue with this particularly newly, newly evolved wetland area on the Outlorgy is whether adults can migrate up to this because the channel is creating a bit of a head cut, which might require some design intervention uh, rather than letting just nature take its course over several years. So, um, essentially the main conclusion of this, the, the talk is that productivity requires connected habitat for multiple life stages and large wood placements, floodplain connection, both result in hydraulic and substrate diversity, which allows spawning habitat and fish holding pools to appear next to fry habitat and food sources. So diversity required for river productivity and that diversity comes from a diversity of, of geomorphic uh, bed forms um, on the river. Uh, just uh, talking about getting late results for AGU, um, we did predict that, that on the front of the gravel moving through this uh, first wetland on the River Nairn, that we would get some um, good spawning habitat. And uh, quite uh, surprisingly, we did spot a red there only yesterday, uh, which this photograph shows quite, quite badly because the lighting conditions weren't great. So to conclude, restoration with large wood provides through natural hydromorphic process increases in connected spawning habitat and fry habitat for Atlantic salmon, including an increase in food for fry from wetland and floodplain areas, although it's still an open question whether Atlantic salmon fry will use wetlands directly for feeding unless channels form within them. Our future work is concerned with extracting environmental DNA, which we're doing with the University of Highlands and Islands Rivers and Locks Institute, in order to determine invertebrate densities in the channel close to the wetlands and also in the wetlands themselves. Uh, so we hope to, to use that data to further investigate the utilisation of wetland areas by, by Atlantic salmon. <laughs>